Hi, it's Wednesday, the 24th of February, and I'm continuing to read and wonder my way through Luke's Gospel. Today we're in Luke chapter 14, verses 15 through 24. Just a little bit, um, carrying on a theme picked up, um, started anyway, yesterday. Uh, you recall perhaps that yesterday Jesus um, was invited to uh, the home of a, of, of a Pharisee, um, an important Pharisee, a leader, and um, and he gave some instructions about, you know, when you come to a big party, don't sit at the head of the table and embarrass yourself when you have to be moved because someone more important came along. A little lesson in humility there. Uh, and then also went on to say that when you have parties, don't don't invite the people who can help you or the people who will be obligated. Like, don't network, essentially, <laughs> I think he was saying, but invite everybody and he made a case for those on the margins the people that aren't often invited to the best parties um, so that's where we pick up today uh, so Luke chapter 14 verses 15 to 24 and one of the dinner guests on hearing this said to Jesus blessed is anyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God and then Jesus said to him someone gave a great dinner and invited many at the time for the dinner, he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I, I've bought a piece of land, and, and I must go out and see it, so please, please accept my regrets. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm going to try them out. Please accept my regrets. Another said, I've just been married, and therefore I cannot come. So the slave returned and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and said to his slave, Go out at once into the streets and lanes of this town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And the slave said, Sir, what you ordered has been done, and, and there is still room. And the master said to the slave, Then go out into the roads and the lanes and compel people to come in so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those who are invited will taste my dinner. often referred to as the parable of the great dinner. Um, and I am reminded that it's a, it's a parable. And so it's not a piece of history. It didn't happen. Uh, and it's meant to, I think, um, to be engaged at many levels. It's, it's meant to poke at us and prod at us. I don't think it, it's meant, it's not a simple allegory or an analogy. It's not, it's not, a, it's not a simple metaphor. Uh, and sometimes I think we take it that way, because indeed, if it's if it's just you know straight metaphor, if it's just sort of straight analogy, well, then you look at this and go, okay, so then the owner, um, the person throwing the party, is is clearly God, uh, and it's very simple to say, so um, so God has invited the people to the banquet, indeed. In this situation, the chosen people, uh, first century Jews. You've had, you know, you are part of the Abrahamic faith. Uh, and so, of course, you're invited. That This party is for you, but then they don't accept it. Okay, got it. We've heard that message before. Um, and it's not a condemnation of all Jewish people. It's acknowledging that, you know, this is the fulfillment of everything that you believe in. You, like, you are built to accept who Jesus is. You, you should be ready to recognize God's presence in the world and yet you're not doing it. Um, and you're making all sorts of excuses not to do it. And I completely get it. Um, but, but it's like, no, you, 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 you should see Jesus who, who he is. Because, yes, but I think that he's blaspheming. Oh, but I think that he's not following the, 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 the custom around the Sabbath and he shouldn't be curing. You're finding all sorts of reasons not to come to the banquet. And the banquet is right there in front of you. Okay, so far so good. I get that. That, that works really well. But if this is just a simple analogy, just a straight metaphor, well, then it would appear that, that God didn't care much about the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame uh, initially. It's only after the others said no. Well, that seems odd. Um, I was pretty sure that God has always been concerned with, with, with all people. Um, so that's where this breaks down a little bit. And, and then even more, well, yeah, we brought all those people, but there's still room. Then compel them. 
I think this has often been a warrant for for those who uh, would call themselves missionaries. Um, I'm not knocking all missionaries, but those missionaries who would force conversion on people. Um, this is compelling them to come in to the banquet so that the house may be filled. Um, that doesn't seem like God to me, not the God that's revealed in Jesus. Um, for I tell you, none of those who are invited will taste my dinner. That uh, anger, that contempt for um, for the Jews who are struggling and not fully getting it, it's not consistent for me anyway with the idea that Jesus is eating with Pharisees, for goodness sakes. He's eating with them and teaching them, and some of them are getting it and some of them aren't, and that's okay. Um, but here in this story, um, no, none of them. None of those who were invited will taste my dinner. Again, another line that can be so can be used so easily to to uh, to support anti-Semitism. Um, and so I I reject that simple reading of this for me personally. I reject it not because I not just because I don't like it. It's not consistent with Jesus. Um, yes, you have an edge when you when you, when you when you say things, and sometimes you're passionate. Uh, and say things like, well, if you don't do this, you'll be sorry. But Jesus is eating with Pharisees. And there were a number of, of those who were raised uh, as Jews, were first century Jews in Jerusalem, a number of them who absolutely recognized who Jesus was and, and were moved by that. And they became followers of Jesus, followers of the way, became Christians. Or stayed nominally Jewish, but were absolutely recognizing that Jesus was fulfilling the scripture. Um, th those people were there. So, so that's where this doesn't make sense. For Jesus to exhibit, exhibit and demonstrate one way of, of experiencing God, and yet in a story, suggest that God is counter to that. Not by it. But as a parable, as a story that's meant for me to use to examine myself and to question myself, I get it, I think. So I invite you to think of this as, as a parable. This is a story, imagine this story is being told for you. Jesus is telling this story right to you. As I listen to this story, um... I recognize this banquet, and I'm going to call that the, the kingdom of God, to be, to be part of that, to be part of community that recognizes uh, God's presence, responds to God's will, shares God's love. There it is, and yet I see it in front of me. I recognize people doing it, and yet from time to time I make up excuse, excuses not to be part. It's only business. That's, that's an excuse. It's kind of similar to one we, we already heard. Um, well, I know, but the real world is different than the church world. You know, that kind of thing we say. I, 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 I'll do that later, but, you know, let's be honest. Better to sin boldly and ask for forgiveness. Um, all sorts of ways that we opt out of being part of the beloved community, uh, of being part of, of, of God's love in the world. I, I do it. I do it. I get too busy. Um, I get too tired. Um, I get all sorts of things that make me withdraw when in fact I shouldn't be withdrawing. I should be managing my time better. I should be being kinder to myself and not burning myself out. I should be doing so that I can be fully participating. Right? These are the kind of things that I think about. The, the parable doesn't say that specifically. Nobody here says, well, I'm just burned out. Um, some of them are making excuses that we roll our eyes at, but others, you know, yeah, I just got married. Well, of course you just got, got me. No, you're not coming to my party. I got it. You just got married. Honeymoon, whatever. Just it's it's totally understand. Yeah, and, and there's all sorts of understandable reasons for me not participating in the kingdom of God. But the fact is, I am making those choices myself. The one who decides to take care of his oxen, the one who goes to review his land, the one who decides to to relish in his new marriage or her new marriage or whoever they are, um, those people have made choices. Might be good choices, might make sense, but they have made choices. 
there is always a choice to opt into the kingdom of God. There's always a choice to live faithfully, uh, but we don't always make the choice. And like I said, in, in, in pandemic times, in this time of COVID, for me, sure, I will sometimes run myself ragged and I will be too tired to respond uh, to the kingdom of God. Um, that's a choice that I made. Oh, I know, but you had to because all these people needed you and they called you for this, they needed you for that. And you can't say no. No, absolutely. All sorts of really good reasons. But I chose. I said yes all of those times to the point where I started to disconnect myself from the kingdom of God. My choice. Right? Uh, and sometimes they are just simple choices like, well, you know, I could do this, I know it's the right thing, but I could make money doing this thing, and frankly, I could use the money, right? I'm not saying money's a bad thing. I'm saying we all make choices. And that's, to me, what this parable is is, is pointing out, that we all make choices. Um, and this does make me wonder a little bit, as if I am the one throwing the party. And when do I get around to inviting the people who are often not invited to parties? We heard about it yesterday. And Jesus said that we should go out and invite those people, right? Don't invite your, your, your brother, your sister, the people who can pay you. But don't do that. Go out instead. And I, I talked a little about ableism, and so I struggle a little bit with the language. But, you know, but, but go out and, and, and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. We were just told. Jesus just said that that's what we should do. So now here is somebody who is doing it, but only because they've been forced to. You see why I don't think it, it, it just works and say, well, that's God. No, I think that now I'm invited to think of myself as the one throwing the party and ask myself, when do I invite those people that other folk aren't inviting? Do I only do it when the others have said they're not available? Um, as I um, as, as I work in committees, as I uh, am part of a church, uh, when do we make space for other voices? When do we really take diversity seriously? When do we look at actual equity? Do we do it when there's no other choice? Uh, you know, you, you, you sit in a board meeting and you look around and you see 10 white men and you go, oh, that's, that's, uh, that's not diverse. That's not who we, we mean to be. But when one retires, you go, okay, so I'm going to make sure that we get somebody who's not a white man. Uh, and so we go out and we get somebody. That's great. And a couple of years from now, maybe another person will retire. So then maybe I'll go out and get someone else who's not simply a white man. I'm not knocking white men, by the way. I am one. Lovely people. Um, but we don't actually have to run everything. And we don't actually have um, the perspective uh, of, 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 of other folk. But so often I see as to, well, when there's an opening, then we will fill it. I sometimes hear the word progressively, uh, but we'll look at, at expanding our diversity. But nobody says, well, you know what? Why don't we just blow this whole thing up and start again? and we'll reconstitute a board and we're gonna make sure that we look at diversities this way and this way and this way and that way and we're gonna look for this kind of, and we're gonna to try to achieve equity um, that we can all be heard and our needs all met and we'll use a whole different way of doing things. No, we don't usually do that. We will wait until, until, there, until there's retirement, until there's erosion and then we'll fill in with somebody new. This story makes me wonder about whether that's the right way to do things. Makes me think about it. Um, makes me also think about what, what is this party about? Why, why, does, why does the banquet um, need to be filled? You know, if I throw a party for, for 100 people and only 80 show up, that's fine. I look around and go, great. More wine, more snacks for everybody. I'm not bothered by that. Why is this party thrower, why is this person uh, bothered by the fact that there could be more people in there? 
And I don't know what that means, but, but I'm invited to wonder about that. Am I, am I to imagine myself as somebody who wants to have a full party? I want everybody in. Um, am I somebody who, who, who needs a certain level of achievement? If I don't get 100 people, then I feel I haven't done my job. Is, 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 is that really the way to be? Or am I to imagine myself as one of those people who's been compelled to be there? You know, I wasn't, wouldn't have been on the original invite list. And in fact, I'm a little too set and privileged to have been on that secondary list. But now, now we're going to come around and now, now I will be uh, invited. Not only invited, in fact, I'll be somewhat compelled. I, I will be pushed into this. Um, so I get to ask myself, so how did I come to the party? How did I come to my faith? Did I, was I on the original invitation list? I mean, was I somebody um, who, who was born into the faith and was brought to it, you know, um, by, by my parents and, and, I, and I grew up in it and I'm one of the originals. Uh, am I somebody who came to the faith because I, because I have a need for community and a need for God's love and I don't experience it as readily in, in, in the world? So I might indeed be, be in that group of, of the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame, whatever, uh, those who are on the margins. Is that how I came into my faith? And how does that make it different? Or am I somebody who's been brought here because I was going to get married and my partner is of the faith and we couldn't marry unless I also took on the faith? Or I just, um, I had to do it because I wanted to get my child into a cer certain school uh, was I strong-armed into it um, by somebody? Did I come into it because it's good for business? Uh, was I compelled for a whole bunch of different reasons? There are three different types of people invited to the party. Which one are you? And, and how? what difference does it make how you came to be in the faith? Um, does it make a difference? Do you look at things differently? Do you look at, do you hear the stories and, or, um, differently? If you were born and raised in the faith or came, um, came humbly into the faith or were somehow pushed into the faith, um, how do you respond? Uh, I, I think it, it's worth thinking about. I don't know that that's what Luke had in mind. I don't know if that's what Jesus had in mind. But it's a parable. So I'm meant, I'm invited to, to wonder about it um, and, and see myself in different different parts uh, of the story. What I got from that last part is there are different types of people who come to church and or come to the faith, whatever the faith is. And very often we assume that we're all the same. You, me, folks over there, we're all in a church together, so we probably see everything the same way. No, 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 we don't. Uh, and, and sometimes we, we run into trouble when we make the assumption that we're all seeing things the same or hearing things the same, or expressing things the same, or that we're all looking for the same thing when we come to the faith. Um, I uh, I have a friend uh, who, who I remember said to me years ago, but it, it, it didn't come from, from uh, her originally, certainly, but, but when she talked about uh, her experience of the black church and the white church um, in North America, uh, so you, you in, in the white church, we're always talking about what we can do for God. And in the black church, we're always talking about what God can do for us. Um, and, uh, and I know that she was quoting somebody else, um, but I can hear her saying it uh, as we talk about the, the experience of church. And, um, and you wonder, so in, in, those, in that generalization, how does that change the way you experience the faith? I mean, if you've come to the faith because what you, you feel that you're here to help God, um, or if you come to the church because you are looking for God's help, how does that change your relationship to, to the community? How does that change your faith? Um, how do you express things? Um, one or, or the other. I think that that's part of what we're being invited into. In this parable, there are three different types of people, right? The original invitees, which might be the first century Jews, might be those of us who were born into the faith. 
Um, the ones who come because those people kept saying, ah, I've got, I've got excuses. And they were taking th this thing for granted. So then, so then the others get to come. Um, and, and those folks came because they had needs, uh, not because they were on the guest list originally, but because they, they, they are recognized by, by their need. I need God in my life. Those are different kind of people. And then there are those who are compelled. And, and what compelled means can change for each of us. But just, I just need to be here. Not because I have a, a great need or any, I just, I need to be here. I can feel it. I am drawn to it. Being drawn, coming out of need, being born into. We have at least those three different types of people within every community. And how do we hear, experience, or express our faith differently? So that's the power of a parable, to make you think. It doesn't necessarily give you answers, but it does invite you to wonder about yourself and your faith. And that's what I suspect I'll be doing with a good chunk of today. Um, wondering about these questions that the parable have raised for me. And I'm going to leave you to do exactly the same thing. So let me offer a prayer. Loving God, we thank you for, for dynamic teaching. Stories that speak to each of us in different ways. Parables and stories that speak to us today and speak to us tomorrow and say seemingly different things. God, we, we ask that you be with us as we examine our faith wonder how it is that we have come to be in relationship with you and wonder how we are going to deepen that relationship. And God, also we wonder how we might share what we have experienced in you, how we might share it with the world. These are some of the things that we wonder about today. But mostly, God, we just give thanks for your presence for your word and your love. We pray through the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. So, friends, wonder. Wonder a lot. It's worth it. Um, and, and know that in your wondering, God is, is with you. Know that in all you do, God's love is expressed. You matter. God bless you. See you tomorrow.